so your MC has returned. And everyone was all worried about me just falling down the stairs and then they'll just have to carry a conversation without me. So um, my apologies, I was a little late, but I can't miss this. Since I have two experts that I can really help ask um, answering these questions for you. So since we were talking about all of this new modern hypnotherapy, how do you pick which one for which patients, Dr. Bitch? All right. Um, yeah, that I think uh, is a, often a dilemma that we face uh, regarding a given patient. What would be best? I think you're asking between bi-specifics and CAR-T. Yeah. That is uh, your question. I would say that in my own uh, view, uh, the CAR-T is something that I usually aim for first for a patient. If possible, it's got some advantages. It's a one and done, uh, and you don't have to worry about anything for long periods of time. Uh, though, as we also said, some people are wanting to put maintenance therapy onto the CAR-Ts, and so we do need to often give immunoglobulins, so they do have to often make visits. But for most part, uh, you know, the intensive phase of your treatment uh, is done. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, the bispecifics, on the other hand, do have the advantage of ready availability. And I've had patients already now uh, within the few months that we've had bispecifics that I've put uh, them onto uh, the phoresis machine, and then I've actually given a bispecific to bridge them because there's nothing else that I have left for to provide them. So I'm actually using both rather than either or. But the advantage of a bispecific is obviously the ready availability. Uh, the other thing is that it appears at least that the bispecifics may have a higher risk for infections in the long term as well. That's also a emerging concern. So for that, uh, those couple of reasons, if possible, I try to go for a CAR-T. Yeah, I, I think, uh, no, I, th I would have to agree with Dr. Ravish. There, there are a couple of points, though, that sometimes really limit having a person go to CAR-T because he mentioned the phoresis uh, 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 process, and one of the things he didn't mention is that you're collecting lymphocytes. Now, if anybody's had a stem cell transplant, you know they went after stem cells, and you know you got those shots. So lymphocytes are floating around in your blood, but one of the drugs that we love really wipes them out, which is steroids. And so occasionally you'll see a person, not, not even that rarely, who has a very low lymphocyte count, meaning that you're not going to be able to collect enough cells to actually make those CAR-T, so that's one issue. The second is uh, our experience right now with CAR-T is there was the hope, as there is in many treatments, that even a person who might be very, very, very ill with lots of myeloma could get a CAR-T and recover from that, and I think the reality is that those very sick, sick patients are not benefiting as much as we would like, and so that we have had the experience that a person has had a CAR-T and a month later their myeloma's back. And I, I don't, I'm sure you've had that experience. Yeah, yeah. So I think what we're trying to figure out is it, our triage is if a person is really in dire need of treatment right now, we're going right for a biospecific because we think that there's a better likelihood that they're going to respond to that. Uh, it's, it's available right off the bat. The, the other strategy that we have been doing is, when we're thinking about moving to cellular therapies, is considering doing a salvage autologous stem cell transplant first. And then thinking about collection of cells and, and saying that you know, we might get fitter T cells by, by doing it that way. Um, but I don't know, but, uh, but certainly you know, the CAR T is, when it works, it's fantastic. I agree. There are so many caveats, and every patient uh, has to be looked at individually. So, um, because all of these treatments, I'm thinking, aren't yet available everywhere, when would you like to see these patients? When should they be referred to you as their doctors may be thinking about changing treatment? Well, it depends who you talk to. Some people would say a diagnosis now, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly uh, I think there's a couple of, of things that Dr. Vij mentioned. Uh, we do have now one earlier, so between two and four types of treatment presented that shows an advantage for doing CAR-T. There is another study we know is positive um, that is going to be presented with one and three. So probably if a person has had a couple of types of treatment, 
and now it's coming back again. We're pretty comfortable with what we do when somebody's diagnosed. And I even think we're reasonably comfortable for that first recurrence of myeloma. But once you start getting at two, now it starts to get a little bit less clear how people are going to do. So I think that would actually be a good time to think about it. And uh, as Dr. Vij mentioned, I think we may be using CAR-T a lot sooner than we are now. Oh, I agree. I think that uh, every uh, physician does have a the referral base and educating the referring physicians is important. Uh, from my own perspective, I would say that the majority of the, uh, the referring physicians around already do this, uh, first in any transplant eligible patient, send the patient at the beginning for transplant evaluation. We generally return them to the care. And I'd say about two thirds of them still pick up the phone when the patient is progressing and say uh, what, uh, what uh, should be done. And this is in the era before CAR T and, bi and bispecifics. I think that will become more important if we have the ability to give a CAR T at very first progression. That may be something that uh, will mean bringing them back in. Uh, whereas uh, right now, at first progression, I often just tell them what would be best to do at their end. So what I'm, what I'm um, hearing from you both is um, it does get so much more complex than ever before, and the collaboration between the local treating physician and actually an expert at a big center will really help us kind of planning out the longer-term care. Um, but there, I mean, there are, uh, Nellie, you were saying, there are folks who got just so sick, we can't wait. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, you know, I, uh, just a, about a week ago, um, somebody locally called me and said that they had an individual who uh, had actually had nine different types of myeloma treatment, had a creatinine of four, um, and, and, and even that isn't a so big a deal, but this particular individual was largely bed-bound and uh, really poor platelet count, and, and we just thought that that is a person who's just very unlikely to benefit from a CAR-T. Now, a, a bi-specific potentially, but for CAR-T, that would be the kind of person that we would say probably not unless you can get their myeloma in better control before you'd consider it. So say if you were to use bispecific first in that case, or, or Dr. Rich and some of your CAR T patients, if they relapse, could they just kind of go to the out the other to the other strategy they haven't yet used? So obviously that we're still going to gather data on that aspect of things. The, what I referred to was using the bispecifics only for a, maybe a time or a cycle or two uh, to bridge that gap. Uh, but the other thing you're asking, I think, is. Uh, if you give a bispecific and just give it till it stops working, uh, uh, would uh, going to a CAR-T at that time be the best strategy or give a CAR-T first and when it stops working, go to a bispecific? That's a different question than the uh, scenario that I posed. From what the data we have, though limited at this time, it seems to suggest that getting a CAR-T and then especially if you have a long period of response, a bispecific still has a reasonably good chance of benefiting you even if directed to the same antigen. On the converse, though the data is very limited, that if you progress on a bispecific, then going to your CAR-T thereafter has less durability. And it also seems that the closer you are to the end of your bispecific, when you get your CAR-T, the worse the outcome of the CAR-T. So I think this is something we'll have to follow. But uh, right now, uh, it also makes logical sense that if you took a CAR-T and you went two, three years, you probably still be able to have those same antigens present on the cell uh, that far out uh, and you could respond to them. On the other hand, if you're re failing to respond to a drug that is directed to a particular antigen and you target that antigen again immediately in a few, we uh, few weeks, then it may not uh, even be there or for some mechanism of resistance may have evolved to that target. Yeah, I think I think this is a, a an area that there's a lot of opinions and not a whole lot of data right now. And it, I've you know I've seen data that's been presented that goes both ways, where some people have said the absolute worst thing you could do before a CAR T is to clostimab, and uh, and then saying you know the best thing you should do is you know, a, a, a T cell redirecting, you know, bispecific before. I mean, I, I think we still are going to have to learn a whole lot more. You know, one analogy, and it may not be correct, is it took everybody a while to appreciate that if you're using anti-CD38 antibodies, daratumumab or isituximab, 
that most of the time, and I'm sure people have exceptions and you probably have an exception there, if you have a person on one and you immediately go to the other, it's probably not gonna work. And the idea is that most of the time, whatever it is that's inhibiting the response to that CD38 antibody, it's gonna apply to the second one as well. I think one of the interesting things that's been presented about CAR-T, although they didn't give a lot of data about the interval, is one of the best recovery or salvage treatments if you fail CAR-T is to go have another CAR-T. And I'm sure you've seen that too, which, and not even a different target, but the same one. And so I find that a little bit confusing. The, the, the presenters of this didn't say if they were using car teas that had been kept in the freezer or where they were getting new ones or things like that. But I think there's going to be a lot more discussion about this as time goes on. Since you were actually mentioning about um, difficulty of collecting the T cells and then the wait time, but also the movement of using this early, do you see us collecting the stem cells for a colitis transplant plus T cells just to have as an instrument? That's an interesting question. I think the, it will boil down to who's going to pay for the collection and the storage. That is a major expense that the insurance companies will probably push back on if uh, you don't intend to use it in the immediate future. That's my uh, fear. And I think um, we have, a, have had a couple of people who, for various reasons, have had T cells uh, collected, manufactured, and now stored, and we haven't used them right away. So we know that there's uh, data that you can probably keep them. Now, uh, you know, again, I'm sure Dr. Vij is very comfortable. We, we've used autologous stem cells that are 15 years old and transplanted with them. I don't know if we know that yet about CAR-T. Could you collect them and make them uh, and then use them many, many years later, or should you just collect the T cells? Because they're pretty, unlike, I, I think Dr. Lee was pinging about how wimpy myeloma cells are if you freeze them, but T cells should be pretty good, and you could potentially just collect the T cells and then manufacture them later on, years later. So I, I suspect all of those permutations people are going to be doing. I agree. So since we were also talking about, well, the T cells uh, are getting, getting tired, getting exhausted, as you said, Dr. Wish, is there a way to wake them back up? Yeah, that obviously is uh, what our colleagues in the lab are trying to uh, work out. I don't think that we know of a definitive way to wake them back up yet, but uh, people are looking at all different strategies with uh, combinations of drugs and things like that. You know, in solid tumors or what we would think of as lung cancer and things like that, they use drugs called checkpoint inhibitors, which are drugs such as, if you've ever heard of them, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and they're actually used in Hodgkin lymphoma and very effective there. Um, we had uh, the uh, experience, we meaning everybody in myeloma, a few years ago to try these drugs, which in the lab looked dynamite against myeloma, and it was not good. It actually led to uh, more patient deaths to incorporate these drugs. But the reason I'm bringing that up is they are supposed to help revitalize your T cells, and there have been anecdotal reports of people using those drugs by themselves after CAR-T with some success, but I think, boy, I, everybody's very nervous about doing that for obvious reasons. Share with us about uh, whether you have any long-term concerns about, you know, in these newer technologies now, we know that response rate is, is high, but then where do we go from here to make it safe also to continue to use them? As I said, one of the long-term concerns that we know of right now is the risk for infections, especially with uh, continued use of bispecific. So people are trying to see if going back to the old paradigm, which years ago we used to treat myeloma, and once we got it to a certain level, we would stop treatment and restart when it started regrowing. In the intervening years, because the drugs became safer, uh, we started saying, okay, we're going to keep people on these for as long as they're working and then move to the next drug immediately once they stop working. So the question is with bispecifics, what we see is, you know, either what I have experienced with bispecifics, either the plane lands and it, uh, it goes to the gate and stays there for a long time, or it is an aborted landing and it goes up like that. So I think that uh, if we uh, have a plane that is landed and is parked at the gate, maybe you could 
you know, for a while, uh, go ahead and stop the treatment because often the plane uh, lands within the first two cycles or it just doesn't land and go to the gate. That's what my own, you know, I, I, analogy I, is. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. So, you know, what by, by that, I think what he's saying is that you, you will see people who have what looks like a really big decline in their protein levels and then it just goes right back up again. And this is a type of treatment for, t for these uh, bispecifics that you know pretty quickly if they're going to help. Usually within a couple of months, I think, is maybe the longest you need yeah, to you really see. reached a deep response and yeah. you're going to stay there for a long time or you're going to just go down slowly and just come back up. No, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think this is also, in a way, um, a nice segue for me to not only Greg is giving me a two, which is a V <laughs> sign, which is not victory. It means I have two minutes. Um, I am wondering, what is the future of these technologies? Are we looking at new targets? Are we mixing them together? Are we, what are we cooking? Well, I think you know, Europe is, it, it may be something that um, I, I suspect many, maybe both of you were hoping to participate in where they were going to do an upfront comparison of CAR-T versus um, autologous stem cell transplant with basically the same type of initial treatment. Um, that study is getting way, the RFDA unfortunately put a hold on it, which I'm not thrilled about. I'm not sure I understand their reasoning, but that would be the kind, that's the kind of really practice changing study if that really works if you end up saying a car t it's going to be easier now i think um i has anybody here had a car t transplant yes i know somebody has i would say m the patients that i've had who've had both that and autologous stem cell transplant would say so much easier than an autologous stem cell transplant less side effects there's a lot of gi side effects from an autologous stem cell transplant you don't get that with car t so i think we're going to see in terms of patient reported outcomes that it'll be easier but i do have some concerns long term because unlike lymphoma where there's a percentage of people who get get a car t for lymphoma it's they are cured we don't, we don't see that in myeloma at least right now so whether you know that's going to be a really good idea to do this early 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 um but i think you know that's something that we're going to have to probably find out. And I, I hope the FDA changes their ruling on that particular trial. That's it open here. Would you be worried about sort of like stimulating the T cells early, whether that's going to potentially cause more side effects or whether we would then exhaust them? Yeah, I think those are all concerns. We, uh, as was said with these checkpoint inhibitors, there was probably overstimulation of the immune cells that led to adverse outcomes. You could theoretically go on overdrive and lead to more toxicity uh, as well uh, by combining agents. So this has to be done carefully in the context of uh, trials. And people, however, are doing it in trials. People are combining teclistamab with telcatamab. Um, and so those are things that are already starting to be done. I got a nod, which means that my job's done. 